Medical Faculty, I am as a moderator uh, for international webinar of today, and let us start stars uh, start of the webinar. Yeah, the first agenda is opening speech from Secretary of Bosoa University, Dr. Insinyur Haji Hadija MSI. Uh, please, Bu. Adija, time is yeah. yours. Okay, thank you, uh, Dr. Rahmayati Tamrin. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. And good afternoon. The Honorable Rector Universitas Bosowa, all vice rector, deans and civitas academica Universitas Bosowa, the Honorable all presenter, this all presenter, Thank you for being writing to attend this webinar. Professor Dr. Aquina Rena Eric, MD, Professor in Quantum Medicine at IUE, University Board of Fort Council of Preventive Medicine from Monaco. And Professor Elena B. Baranova, MD, PhD, President of the Europe, European Institute of Personalized Prevention and Health Board of WOCBM Monaco. The Honorable Associate Professor Moni Rudin Kouduri, MD, PhD, Lincoln University, Malaysia. The Honorable and my friend, Professor Debbie Susanti Finsky, MD, MSG, PhD, President of World Council of Preventive Medicine, Cell Test Stem Cell Center Jakarta, is my beloved friend from friend from one high school. Uh, the Honorable Professor Renhal J. Medina, MD, PhD, Queen's University, Belfast, UK, and the Honorable Fernando Abarzua, MD, PhD, Robotic Surgery in Paraguay. And yang terhormat Bapak Muhammad Agung, MD, PhD, Deputy Dean, First Medical Faculty of Bosoa University. And all participants, including all medical faculty students from uh, Medical Faculty Bosoa University. First of all, let us praise and thank to Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala for the blessing that is outpoured abundantly to our every, every life, everyday life, for the good health that is given to us, we can attend this international seminar virtually and non-virtually. Also to the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, who gives light to humanity and human civilization because we will not enjoy our current states today without him. I am the Secretary of University of Kosoa, representing the Chancellor of the University of Kosoa, uh, Professor Dr. Insinyur Muhammad Saleh Palu, Master Engineering. I want to welcome all the distinguished invited speakers today in this international webinar organized by the Medical Faculty of Universitas Kosoa. I welcome you all virtually uh, to the Universitas Bosua campus. I am glad that you can participate as a speaker for today's event. I hope that we will get valuable new knowledge from all the fantastic speakers who will present their presentation virtually based on the theme given. I also would like to greet the respectable readers of Universitas Bosua attending this international webinar to all the vice rector, deans, and civitas academica Universitas Bosoa, also the respectable leaders from Bosoa Education, and all the participants of today's webinar. There are three important things that I want to share regarding this webinar. First, I want to thank the medical faculty of Universitas Bosoa, especially Dr. Marhain Harjo. Dr. Marhain Harjo is a dean for organizing this international webinar. If I am not mistaken today, it's the third day of the series of the 
this webinar as a series of the certified Universitas Bosoa Dais Natalis. Dais Natalis, I hope that this event will provide with input to medical faculty, the development and Universitas Bosoa as a whole. The theme if, uh, of this webinar is about advanced medicine and technology in medical society fight for disease. Just reading the theme, I guess that the discussion will be lively uh, and exciting. I am not from medical, but I'm physicist. However, learning different point of view will help to borrow them one's uh, perspective. I guess. We are all familiar with the concept of society 5.0, where the more human perspective will indicate life. So I guess that what will be discussed in this event is how medical produce medicine benefit it from advanced technology to save human life. For example, stem cell. The second a pandemic caused by COVID-19 has changed our life significantly, including how we organize in even in even. This international webinar is an example. Without a pandemic, we can meet face to face and travel to a new place. Knowing <laughs> the character of the visited place and the delicious local food. However, we must be satisfied to meet virtually while coping and trying the pandemic will so go so go soon. So we in Universitas Bosoa can greet and welcome our guests with generosity and hospitality. And my last point is that I hope this webinar will go well and be indeed successful. Please enjoy the webinar until the end. Once again, congratulations to medical faculty for organization for organizing this international webinar. With the words of Bismillahirrahmanirrahim, I officially open the international webinar with the theme Advanced Medicine and Technology in Medical Society 5.0. Thank you so much. Billahi topik wal hidayah. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you. Waalaikumsalam warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Sadija, for uh, for the warm speech. Uh, the next speech uh, will be delivered by Dean of Medical Faculty, Boswa University, as keynote speaker with the title "Realizing Society 5.0." Time is yours, Dr. Marhaen Harjo, MBOMed PhD. Please, Dr. Thank you very much, Dr. Arim, and uh, good afternoon for all of you. In the course, I would like to thanks to our honorable uh, Secretary of University Buzoa, Wija, yeah? and also I would like to thanks to my Vice Dean, Vice Dean, Vice Dean One, Dr. Muhammad Agung. Vice Dean Two, uh, Dr. Hadianti, and also Vice Dean Three, uh, Dr. Surian Surana. Uh, without you, this uh, event cannot, of course, happen. And also, I would like to thanks for our collaborator, Prof. Devi Susanti Pinsky, for full support to organize this uh, event to invite speakers around the world, and we uh, have already uh, go, go to the day two seminar, webinar in today. And also I would like to thanks to all participants attending this uh, webinar. I'm very respectful uh, during your uh, busy time, you can join in the webinar 
and also to participate and also uh, to celebrate our uni university anniversary 35. And today I would like uh, to talk about the Realizing Society 5.0. As you know, uh, so many people ask me why I'm talking about Society uh, 5.0. Actually, uh, this idea came from Japan. Yeah. Uh, they, made, they call uh, the Society 5.0 is a super smart uh, community yeah, in Japan. And half of the speaker come from the, the, uh, the Japan University. I and Dr. Muhammad Associate Professor uh, Monerudin Chaudhuri, we graduated from the Hiroshima, uh, Okayama University and Hiroshima University in the middle of uh, Japan. And also my friend, uh, Professor Renhal, and also Dr. Fernando, graduate from Okayama University in the same time. It means we grow up in the university, in the same university, in the same uh, country, and we feel so happy during this time. And also uh, the another, the other participants such as Prof. Devi and also Prof. Elena, Prof. Eric, also have already visited Japan and see how uh, amazing this country. Before I have already talked about the uh, Society 5.0 introduction, and today I would like uh, to talk about how to realize in the Society uh, 5.0. We aim at creating a society where we can resolve various uh, social challenges by incorporating the innovation of the fourth industrial revolution. Example, IoT, Internet of Things, Big Data, Artificial Intelligence, AI, Robot, and the Society of the Future will be one in which new volume and surface are created continuously. Making people's life more comfortable and sustainable. This is Society 5.0, a super smart society. Japan will take the lead to realize uh, this ahead of the rest of the world. And now, we are talking about the medical society. Of course, medical society is one part of the uh, super smart society. The Venetian Society 1.0 uh, as the hunter better state of human development. We have now passed through the agrarian and industrial states Society 2.0 and 3.0 and are moving beyond the information at Society 4.0. We now enter in Society 5.0. Yeah. Solution for better human life. Big data collected by Internet of Things will be converted into a new type of intelligence by AI and will reach every corner of society. As we move into Society 5.0, all people's lives will be more comfortable and sustainable as people are provided with only the products and services in the hour and at the time needed. Japan has appetites that make Society 5.0 possible. Because the fact number one, abundant accumulation of real data based in health and medical data from a universal health care system and a well of operating data from numerous manufacturing facilities. Japan has an environment rich in real and usable raw data for use in the current market economy and industry. 
The fact number two, technology cultivated from monosukuri. Japan's advanced technology cultivated from monosukuri, Japan's excellence in the manufacturing of tin, and years of basic research will work as advantage to work creating product using information technology like uh, big data and AI, which can then be released into our society. By taking the advantage of three unique factors, Japan will overcome social challenges such as the decrease in the productive egg population, aging of local community, and energy and environmental issues ahead of other nations. We will realize a vibrant economic society by improving productivity and creating new market. By doing the Japan will play a key role in expanding the new society 5.0 model to the world. Society 5.0, of course, will change the world. In the healthcare, Japan is facing an aging society ahead and of other country. The country is suffering from increasing medical and social security expenses and demand uh, for caring for the elderly. The solution is connect and share information between medical data users, including medical checkup records, as well as treatment and nurse, nursing care records. Put remote uh, medical care service into practice and use AI and robot at nursing care facility to support people independence. You know, before uh, our health care system, like in 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 up and in the below after, uh, by connecting and sharing medical data that is now disappeared in various hospital, effective medical treatment based on the data will be provided. Remote medical care makes it possible that elderly people will not longer have to visit hospital frequently. Also, you can measure and manage health data such as heart rates while at home, so that it will be possible to extend people healthy life expectancy. In mobility, the issue is population decline result in underpopulated rural area with lack access to public transportation. The fast growing e commerce segment has seen a shortage in the uh, drivers. Solution is promote use uh, of autonomous driving taxi and bus for public transportation to make rural transportation more readily available. The second, improve distribution and logistic efficiency by introduction innovation such as a single driver cargo truck in convoy using an unnamed following vehicle system and by using uh, drones. And uh, we can see how the change from the before and after. People in underpopulated area find it difficult to shop and visit hospital because of a lack of public transport, transportation. However, <coughs> autonomous vehicle will enable them to travel more easily while delivery drones will make it possible to receive whatever someone needs. A sort type of distribution labor will not be a worry. And in the infrastructure, the issue is deterioration of public infrastructure developed during Japan's rapid economic growth. Prayot has created a shortage of skilled labor and an increase in the financial burden for inspection and maintenance. The solution is sensor <coughs> AI and robots will be used to expect inspect and maintain roads, bricks, tunnel, and dams. As we have seen, you can see in before and after. Mm -hmm. By employing new technology include information and communication technology, robot sensor for uh, inspection and maintenance system that requires special skills, detection of place that need repair and can be met at any early step by doing so 
unexpected accident will be minimized and the time spent in construction work will be reduced, while at the same time, safety and productivity will increase. <coughs> Finally, in the fine tech, the issue is a high proportion of Japanese more money transactions are still conducted in cash and bank. Procedure are cumbersome. Usage of IT income, in company is limited and installation of cashless payment and company financial service is slow. The solution is <coughs> one, use uh, blockchain technology for money transfer. Second, introduce open application programming interface to FinTech. Sorry. Yeah, no. Okay. Uh, in overseas remittance is burdens because you have to spend time and pay bank fee. fee. Blockchain technology will reduce time and cost while ensuring safety in global business transportation. Okay, that's all. Thank you, Dr. Arin. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Marhaen, for giving your valuable insight on the topic. It's very uh, futuristic and interesting topic. Okay, the, uh, uh, all participants, uh, we before uh, I open the first session, uh, please to keep uh, the quality of sound functional during webinar. Uh, please mute yourself when you are not sharing, sharing anything. Okay. Uh, okay. Oh. Uh, I feel privileged to extend it. Warm welcome to all presented here. Um, before I want to, uh, the first uh, presenter, I want to call, uh, there is a uh, Prof. Reinhold Medina in here. Or second. Uh, uh, will join us at at 7 p.m. Yes. Uh, 17 p.m. Okay. You have to start from the beginning. Uh, I move to... Maybe I move to uh, the, the second speaker. The uh, Dr. Minorodin Kauduri is... I'm sorry, Dr. Yes. Dr. Muhammad the Agung is the first. Dr. Ari, please take oh, the yes. list. Okay, okay. Okay, Doc. Thank you. Uh, so uh, the first uh, uh, presenter of the of today is Dr. Muhammad Agung, PhD. Uh, I want to uh, give me time to read the CV of uh, Dr. Muhammad Agung, PhD. Uh, name uh, Dr. Muhammad Agung, S uh, PhD, uh, from from uh, Fakultas uh, Fakulta, uh, Medical Faculty of Universitas Hasanuddin. And after that, uh, from Department of Orthopedic Surgery in Hiroshima University, and doctoral program in Biomedic Applied Science or Orthopedic Surgery, Department of Hiroshima University. And now, uh, Dr. Agung is Deputy Dean in a Medical Faculty of uh, Bosua University. And then uh, it's time yours, Dr. Agu. Please, time is yours. I give you 15 minutes. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Arin, for the opportunity. Uh, firstly, I would like to greetings all our friends from Indonesia. Good afternoon, especially my best friend from Malaysia, Associate Professor Dr. Chaudhry, PhD. We come from the same university, Hiroshima University. So I would like to share my presentations. Oh, sorry, sorry. 
Hmm. Oke. Okay. Okay. <coughs> Today my topic will be role of visual engineering in public damage. So, particular particular cartilage damage is an interesting topic and also a challenge topic in orthopedic field. It has the two primary functions to eliminate friction when flexion and extending joint, and also providing a protective during a high impact activity. So why is articular cartilage damage so important? The articular cartilage lack of blood vascularization. As we see here, even if there is a defect in the cartilage, there's no bleeding inside. And the secondly, the matrix within the articular cartilage is very compact. So it's made almost impossible for compressed cells to migrate to the detect site. The cartilage itself has a three type and the articular cartilage, we call it hyaline cartilage, which is type two collagen. No vascular, no neural or lymphatic supply. So basically we can, we can say the articular cartilage has a poor capacity to heal by itself after injury. There is a saying in orthopedic field, once cartilage has been damaged, cannot be repaired. So what is the, the, the new in cartilage damage management in the past, in the present, and the future? Uh, recently, for the cartilage damage, there's innovation for treatment of the cartilage damage with tissue engineering, which is uh, can be autologous chondrocyte implantations or bone marrow uh, mesenchymal stem cell implantations. So my presentations will be based on uh, tissue engineering cartilage, uh, like tissue for treated the articular cartilage damage. This uh, has been published in Atoscopy uh, Medicine in the United States. And also based on my research, uh, bone marrow mesenchymal stem cell for the intraarterial cartilage injury, which have been published in Nishagri Spot and Paratomology Arthroscopy in Belgium. So the cartilage has a two uh, mainly components, matrix and the composite cells containing within the matrix. This is the layer of the cartilage, has a five layer. So the articular cartilage can be damaged by the trauma degenerative process, inflammatory process, and still unknown. Uh, when we want to grade in the articular damage uh, by atroscopy or the macroscopy, for the simple one from atroscopy, the grade one is only softening the superficial of articular cartilage. Mm -hmm. The grade two is less than 50%, and the grade three is the damage more than 50%. Eh? Hey. Is with octagonal bone exposed. So this is the resistance. Begini, begini. Apa? Apa? So the articular cartilage damage is the most common condition to affect the joint. And the OI itself uh, usually will rise with increasing the age. This is the biomedical and so on. When the chondrocyte dysfunctions, the metaphotonous enzyme will release and eventually causing collagen and corporeal degradation and so on and so on. So, Basically, we can define from abnormal cartilage with normal stress, such aging, 
inflammatory process and the endocrine function. And from abnormal stress within normal coverage, such as trauma, obesity, or alignment of knee joint, can produce the destruction of fungicide. So as we all know, this is the how to diagnose from the X-ray. There's a narrow vein space, so osteochondral sclerosis. From the MRI, there's a brightness within the upper surface. And of course, the definitely uh, diagnosis from arthroscopic finding. So as we already mentioned before, articular cartilage damage progressed slowly over a period of many years, but unfortunately cannot heal by itself. So how we manage the cartilage injury? As we already know, there is a operative treatment and non-operative treatment. For non-operative treatment, we knew about the non-pharmacologic and pharmacologic approach. And from a pharmacologic approach, we knew there is a medicamentous oral drugs and intra-articular injections. And we come to the operative treatment. In the past, we usually, we usually do the development stimulation of interfluid healing, osteochondral graft implantations, heart tubal osteotomy, arthrosis, and tiny vein vein replacement. So I will briefly uh, discuss about uh, this operative treatment. This is uh, approximately about the uh, cartilage treatment options. So as we see, for the Redman and Lovage, only for palliative treatment. And for the intrinsic healing uh, treatment, such as microfracture, micro drilling, it can only use to reparative treatment. Why? Because microfracture and drilling only produce fibrocartilage like tissue. And within time, this will be destructions. So only reparative. And for the uh, tissue engineering, both chondrocyte autologous implementation or bone marrow implantations and osteochondral grafting can be used as reparative and restorative for the articular damage. This is about the algorithm of cartilage repair treatment based on the size of the defect. So this is arthroscopic development. So the basic for the arthroscopic development is reduce the inflammation and mechanical irritation. For the stimulation intrinsic healing, the basic principle is penetrating the secondary bone to produce bleeding. Why? Because the cartilage tissue ability to penetrate itself is limited because not contained blood fissure. So bleeding is necessary for healing. But unfortunately, the tissue made by this Intensive killing only fibro cartilage, not hyaluron cartilage. So maybe within one or two years, the tissue itself will be destruction. And we move forward with the another treatment, osteochondral transplantation. So the basic principle for the osteochondral transplantation is to move to transplant the normal arterial cartilage into the damaged area. So osteochondral cartilage plug will be harvested and put into the defect area. It could be autograft or allograft, but since the donor sites come from non bearing area and very limited uh, sources, so we can treat only very limited uh, size of defect. This is the one year follow up. So the advantage is no disease transmission, of course, no immunorejection uh, issue, the high rate of union, and, and of course, from the side viability, the disadvantage is the supply of expendable autogenous graph is limited, and there's a course of concern about the donor site mobility. And if the uh, article damage progress, came to the advanced leg stage with very painful for the patients, then the total knee replacements will be the uh, option surgery. Like this one, we received the 
camera of an area and the surface, like this one. So we can uh, prevent uh, this kind of operation with tissue engineering and cell-based therapy. So what is tissue engineering? Tissue engineering is combined of cellular components, growth and differentiation factor, and of course, scaffold or matrix. This combined of three, the goal is to improve biological function. For the articular cartilage damage, the challenge is how to engineer cartilage that is biochemically, structurally, and biomechanically similar to the normal cartilage. This is my uh, research about the, uh, this is my case report, as I mentioned before. Uh, this is the American cartilage tissue uh, for treated the uh, articles damage of the palace. And this is the first case report uh, in orthopedic field. So, firstly, uh, orthopedic surgeon professor from United States in 1987 has deployed the uh, cartilage tissue engineering with monolayer culture. And in 1969, orthopedic surgery department of Petrosina University modified the uh, Professor Bitburg uh, monolayer culture with three dimensional uh, culture. So we, we use a uh, dimensional scaffold. This is shift the tissue engineering from cell transplantation to tissue transplantation. And we have a good clinical result with this surgical treatment. So ACI, the benefit is can be used for defect of the 20 millimeter in size and only using the patient on cartilage cells with two stage operation procedure. Firstly, we have testing the cartilage under arthroscopic procedure and ground outside the body in this culture culture. And after some time of preparation, the second surgical procedure is performed to implant this cell into the defect. So as I mentioned, uh, Professor Big Dog used the first generation of ACI, and uh, we in Hiroshima use the third generation. So what is first generation? First generation is we took the help non weight bearing error cartilage and then bring to the laboratory and with enzymatic digestion, then we collect the uh, chondrocyte cell. And after some uh, three weeks cultivation, we do the treatment treatment for, treatment, treatment treatment for the uh, cleansing and then collect some about 2.6 to 5.0 FN for 5.3 million cells. This collected uh, suspensible compressed cells then inject to the defect cell and after by with peristyl uh, to the layer. After some this uh, the picture of this one. The third dimension from the suspensible we come to the scaffold like a fluid cell tissue. So the advantage from the first, because the first is uh, suspensible. So how to distribute evenly the contrasted cells? Is, that's the, the problem. Contents, cells and growth factor, and degrade slowly within six, uh, more than six months. So in briefly, ACI, the benefit is can produce hyaluron cartilage like tissue. With, we can use from moderate to large defect. And now, over than 15 years of history, clinical using in operative treatment. And of course, the disadvantage of this ACI is invasive. Second stage operations, of course, uh, more expensive than one stage operation. So we come to the stem cell, the future treatment for the everything, including the orthopedic surgery field. 
uh, especially for my uh, specialty, cartilage and bone. So what are the stem cells? Stem cell is a primitive cell, undifferentiated cell, which can be uh, directed to many kind of different cells. This is the lineage of the strong cell. So there's uh, some benefit, but uh, briefly I can say, first, it's flexible because we can use this stem cell to form many other type of tissue. And the secondly, because usually stem cells uh, come from the autologous, so you don't have uh, immune rejection issue. In orthopedic field, we can use the bone repair, muscle repair, tendon repair, and bone or cartilage repair. So for the stem cells uh, itself, I have uh, published one about the bone marrow mesenchymal stem cell for the interarticular injury and it has been published in the Sagittarius of Entomology in Belgium. So stem cells have a three unique properties. One is uh, primitive and undifferentiated. And secondly, stem cells are capable to be dividing and renewing themselves for long periods. And of course, probably we can direct the differentiation into specific mature cell type, uh, depending on the researcher ability. For me, my ability is to develop a stem cell into the cartilage tissue. So there's a dispute about adult stem cell and embryonic stem cell. Some of researcher prefer the Adam's uh, adult stem cell than embryonic stem cell. Why? Because the natural is already existing already. Searching for the and also because the cells become the natural environment of the This is debatable about what is uh, best for uh, the mirror mesenchymal stem cell. There is no mesenchymal stem cell. Thank you. 
Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Agung, for uh, your presentation uh, today. The topic is very interesting. And now, without further ado, we will uh, turn the time over to second presenter. Uh, before that, uh, if you have any question during the presentation, please type them into the chat box uh, in the um, end of the session, at the session, I will read the question. Okay, uh, the second presenter is uh, Prof. Elena Baranova, medical doctor, PhD, uh, is a president of the Europe Institute of uh, Personalized Prevention and Health Board of WOCPM Monaco. With the title is uh, Quantum Genomics, the future is today. But uh, we will show the video from Dr. Elena because can join uh, us directly here. So uh, admin from uh, FK Medical Faculty, please share. Hello everybody. Happy to see you. Hello, all our OCPM members and uh, everybody, all doctors. So today I would like to introduce you a very specific topic, which is quantum genomics. And uh, you will see that the future is already today with this very innovative and uh, highly sophisticated approach. The main opportunities of the anti-aging in 21st century are in fact genomics and in particular in holistic way, quantum medicine, advanced micronutrition and of course biopeptides uh, and hormones. Genomics is not the same as genetics. Genomics is all about how our environment, food, sun, pollution can influence our gene activity. And you do it every day, just enough to ask what you take for breakfast in order to understand do you influence your genes in a good way or not very good for your health. But behind genomics, there is a long story, including quantum biology and uh, the very sophisticated and beautiful approach coming from uh, quantum mechanics, it concerns the conversion of energy into forms that are usable for chemical transformations. The medical examples are very simple, like vision, for example. Our eye transforms the light, the frequency of uh, different colors, into the vision in our brain. Other example in the nature is photosynthesis and there are many others. It's somehow the basis of uh, our world existence. Interestingly, the godfather of uh, quantum theory in physics was uh, Erwin Schrödinger and he wrote a book, What is Life? regarding this, so you can uh, see more details, of course, with it. Quantum genomics is the transformation of gene expression of energy in different biological processes, including cellular respiration. And you know that cellular respiration is the basis of life. We can see it on this picture. When we talk, when you listen to me, that's what exactly what's happening in your body. It's the photo of real gene expression. So our genes are alive. They do something and this is the real photo of what they do. Don't separate your genes from the body because all what you do will influence your gene expression. Therefore, the really progressive vision of aging today is the decline of our gene activity. 
So anti-aging, in particular advanced anti-aging, would be optimization of our gene activity in order to keep the levels of gene expression on the optimal levels. For many years we work on development of specific products, how to bring it to practice. And we've done a lot of studies in quantum genomics together with the Russian Institute of Genomics and uh, Prenatal Diagnosis together with Moscow Clinics and uh, of course our Institute of Personalized Prevention and Health in Monaco. And we created specific products which uh, really influence and work for gene expression. We can see different effects with these products. Physically, you feel, first of all, the anti-fatigue effects, increased brain activity, physical performance, work performance, etc. That's how it looks. This is the first time uh, it is really shown, not only in numbers, but in pictures. On the one side, you can see the person before intake of our product, which we call Energy One or Gene, based on NAD plus, very strong molecule which influences cellular respiration. And we see the result in 45 minutes, significant increase of gene expression what is registered with biological fields. And you can see on the diagram in the bottom how different centers and organs increase their energy. The same effect with the other top product, which is called Lycogen on the basis of lycopene, the major antioxidant which influences the gene expression, and in particular for detox activity, cardio protection, but also for the beauty of skin. So finally, we can see a significant improvement after genomic recommendations of the treated persons. In conclusion, molecular processes in our organism are linked with quantum changes in the biofields level. It's spectacular how we can see it on the specific uh, equipment. The changes can be visually demonstrated. It's very important. The supplements we have created have strong effects of activation of biological processes uh, through different gene expression, especially bioclock genes, and uh, have significant clinical effects for anti-fatigue, brain activity, anti-stress and detox. So I can only wish you to transform the energy of your genes into the energy of your life and uh, Professor Kinarena, specialist in quantum medicine, will continue this story. Thank you. Okay. Uh, uh, after that, uh, we want to the next presenter is from Eric uh, Aquirena. Medical doctor is a professor in quantum medicine in IUI University, a board of a WOCPM in Monaco, with uh, the title is quantum medicine. Yeah, please. Please show the video. Please uh, show the video. Yeah, what? Okay. Hello, dear, dear colleagues. So uh, I'm happy to share with you some uh, information about uh, what quantum medicine can do in our daily practice as a part, a full part now, of uh, integrative medicine. So it can be matched with every kind of therapy, diagnosis for preventive medicine, uh, uh, predictive medicine and uh, treatments, and moreover, follow-up of our treatments. So. Uh, there is a measure I want to show you, for example, the measure of energy field. The energy field is the combination of ions and photons emitted by each of our cells um, during all the biochemical reactions that happen in the body. The quality and the density of this energy field is directly related with the state of health of uh, a person. So, I can show you here some before and after treatment examples. Uh, by treatments, I understand all kinds of treatments you can perform in your uh, personal practice. Could be quantum medicine, frequencies, could be uh, food supplements, um, exercise, meditation, classical medicine, even surgery. So you can measure the before and after result, have a follow-up on time of your, your patients. So here you can see a very perturbated um, energy field with a very, very thin uh, dimension, 
with a very dull color, the energy levels for mental, intellectual, intuitional and physical energy are low. The stress level is quite elevated. And after the treatment, you can see uh, it's not still perfect, but it's much better. You have a much, much more uh, luminous image, more dense, uh, with a level of energy that is uh, pretty higher. Another way to measure this energy field uh, is by the BioWell system. It's a little bit more complicated, but gives some good results. You can have here the state of the chakras. Chakras are energetic centers that are linked to our hormonal system. Here you can see, for example, hypothalamus, thyroid, thymus, etc. Pancreas, uh, adrenal, adrenal glands, and uh, sexual glands. Um, here you can see the energy field that is very, very perturbated with a very big, uh, very big holes. Uh, that means that some organs are in, uh, in danger or functionally very, uh, in danger. And here you can see after the treatments the totally reconstructed uh, energy field and here the perfectly aligned chakras. With this device we measure the functional activity of each organ our body. We can check quite everything. Uh, here, for example, it's a brain arteria. So we can see with the very dark uh, icons that the functional activity is low. Uh, uh, it touched the uh, arterial brain, blood flow, cognitive function uh, are slowed down. You can isolate which, why uh, this perturbation happens. Here we can isolate uh, chronic fatigue syndrome and uh, uh, presence of amoeba in the in the gums, and after the treatments, you can see the very bright icons and the functional activity is fully restored. That is proved after by the clinical result we can measure. We can treat with this specific uh, frequency. There is a lot of different frequencies for each kind of affection you can imagine. Uh, after your diagnosis could be by quantum diagnosis or clinical or biological analysis, you have your diagnosis, so you know exactly what to treat. So you just have to select what, which kind of affection you treat. It's converted in healing frequencies specific uh, that are sent to the client and could be uh, transformed in MP3 format so your, your patients can have his treatment on his smartphone or tablet at home and continue for a couple of months. Detoxification is very important, and this is a very good way, quantum ionic uh, detoxification, to help your client to get rid of all those heavy metals, toxins, um, after an infection and treatments, uh, bacterial toxins, etc. In 30 minutes, you can see the amount of toxins you can remove from the body of your clients. It's amazing. Uh, what, are the, what could be the result? This is a very spectacular case with a, a person with a very severe uh, problem with the legs, of a, with edema, the, the skin is uh, wet, it's a very... Um, so, you can see the picture, make your diagnosis. After the treatment, after only three months uh, of uh, integrative medicine treatment, that means quantum therapies and uh, food supplements. I used the uh, Professor Baranova's one because they have a very strong activities not only on the biological system but on the energetic system. And you can see after three months only, it's totally finished. And if you see uh, the face of this person uh, who suffered from this state for years without any progress uh, with corticoids, with uh, everything. So in three months, this is a result we can get. So I thank you for your attention. I regret not having more time to share this with you. And uh, I hope we can see each other uh, in real life soon. Bye bye. Okay. Uh, even though Prof. Elena and Prof. Eric can join with us directly, but I, can, uh, I think the explanation can be received well. Uh, and if you have a question to them, uh, you can type into the chat box and we will uh, continue to them uh, by email. Yeah. Okay, well, we will next uh, presentation is wait is associate associate 
Prof. Uh, Monirudin Kauduri, medical doctor, PhD, from uh, Lincoln University, Malaysia. Title is uh, Advanced Medicine in Stem Cell Therapy for Critical Limb Ischemic, Lime Ischemic. And I want to read the CV from Dr. Monirudin, uh, now PhD from Hematology Oncology, Hiroshima University, Japan, at fellow in Hiroshima University Hospital and National Cancer Center at Singapore. Uh, now is a uh, associate professor medicine in Faculty of Medicine, Lincoln University College in Malaysia. Uh, for Dr. Monirudin, time is yours. Yeah, Ms. Rahmat, Rahmati, can you all hear me? Thanks you, thank you so much for your kind introduction about me. Yes, can you see my slides? Yes, bro. Excellent. And first of all, I also my sincere gratitude to the uh, secretary of the University of Boswa and Dean Dr. Marhain Harjo and also the deputy dean Dr. Muhammad Agun and Dr. Agun, thank you so much for your kind words before your presentation starts. So as we have limited time, so let me proceed on about the talk. Right, I appreciate you all of those distinguished uh, colleagues and the listeners here today. So today our topic is autologous bone marrow mononuclear cell implantation is a useful treatment option to prevent amputation among the patients with peripheral arterial disease. So we all know about this situation, right? It's a traffic jam. I think the most common enemy of modern life. So, uh, but how will it will be if in our body has a beautiful blood trafficking system, if there is a jam, what is that? Yeah, so if there is a jam, you know, that means the blood vessel become narrowed or totally blocked. This is a peripheral arterial disease. And when it is actually too much narrowing or totally blocked, that will produce very severe pain. And patient might come to you to say that, please cut my foot, I'm so pain, I cannot sleep. And then if it cannot be treated, it might result in situation like this. And then at this point, there is no other way but to amputation. It means to cut the leg or foot, feet, maybe you need to cut below knee or above knee. So, so actually what could be the solution? So the, this, this is the condition, this peripheral arterial disease is a very common prevalent problem around the globe. I think we all have the family members who have some diabetes and we have seen some leg ulcer in them. And this PAD is the leading cause of amputation in people age 50 and older, almost 90% amputations overall in the whole around the globe. So actually what could be done to prevent this kind of very serious more morbidity and, uh, and, and, and to prevent uh, actually uh, this, this kind of situation. So let us have a look. So, yes, so actually, you know, the, the morbidity resulting from amputation is like that. So that there are some conventional options in a form that actually uh, the vascular surgery, but the vascular surgery, the problem of vascular surgery, it cannot correct capillary and re-stenosis is also very common. So, so the, it was actually the uh, Professor uh, Murohara, from Japan, one renowned cardiologist, he proved that there are some circulating endothelial progenitor cell in the peripheral blood. In the blood, that means those cells actually, you know, circulates in our blood system. There are some circulating endothelial progenitor cells. So now the question is, yes, our blood and bone marrow have some endothelial progenitor cell, that means that cell that can convert into the endothelium and can make the blood vessel. So now the issue is actually this was defined as progenitor endothelial cell and they have a higher concentration in CD34 positive bone marrow stem cells. So the, now the question is, and his contribution resulted in publication in a science uh, in 1997. So, the, now the question is, is this progenitor endothelial cell can collect in the side of ischemia? That means there is a no blood supply and can attempt to uh, correct this situation. So the subsequent experiment, you know, the, it's using 
mouse model, autologous and allogenic mouse model. You know, this, this is actually heterologous mouse model. And this M is actually uh, autologous mouse model. And this one is autologous rabbit model. So using some ischemia in those animals, so the, it says, you can see that actually those specialized cell can collect in the site of ischemia. So it's a promise now. And the subsequent, uh, and the angiography, this is the autologous rabbit model, see that there is actually a generation of new blood vessel in them. So using the bone marrow mononuclear cell that, that is believed to have the stem cell fraction has actually the higher, num the higher number of uh, blood vessel compared to the just fibroblast. So now, the, the, if we look at the black blood flow, the perfusion level, yes, blood perfusion also increased. So that created a hope that actually uh, you know, something can be done in the human uh, system as well. So let's say this is a peripheral arterial disease patient and they have the broken arteries here or blocked arteries or the areas of traffic jam. So if we inject the, the bone marrow stem cells, does it change the situation or not? Yes. So can it form the situation like that? So that's the question mark. So to answer this question, the clinical trial was run. So the patient with chronic critical limb ischemia with uh, severe rest pain and or non-helic ischemic ulcer and not candidate for non-surgical or surgical revascularization and evidence of malignant neoplasm were excluded. So with this criteria, those patients, that means they have to get amputation. They were recruited for this clinical trial, those who have no other option. So, and then the procedure, I think here, I think the majority of the audience are doctor. I think all of the doctors here knows this, the uh, bone marrow aspiration procedure. So it's actually simple bone marrow aspiration, but when you collect it at, uh, around 1000 milliliter, it's not bone marrow aspiration, it's uh, harvesting, and it should be done under general anesthesia as well. So this was actually, we were doing this in the Hiroshima University Hospital. So then you can see that this bone marrow is uh, some filters, and then you can see that actually this double filters making the final elicate, higher concentration, and from there, this is the, uh, the, the, the filtration bag and using this machine, this cell separator system, actually you can, uh, you can make it a concentrate, a final concentrate of 70 to 100 milliliter. And then you can, we can inject it in the, around the line of the artery in a system like that, just intramuscular injection. Idea is to uh, regenerate the blood vessel. So now, amazingly, actually these people don't have the blood vessel. So if you actually inject, Indeed, there could be more chance of ulcer, more chance of amputation. But after four weeks of implantation, ankle brachial pressure index, uh, transcutaneous oxygen pressure, pain-free walking, and pain score all improved. So this is the, some beginning cases. And it was a case of 72 years women with atherosclerotic obliterance. That means the peripheral arterial disease due to high blood pressure, diabetes, and or hyperlipidemia. So, and let us see the blood vessel formation. Then you can see that after four weeks in implantation, there is improvement in case of angio angiogenesis. That means the blood vessel uh, in that case. So again, another 75 years old man, and because these are the Japanese people, maybe more, uh, you know, the, even though he has this, maybe still the fitness level is good. So we can put him also in the, under general anesthesia and do the bone marrow harvesting and can do the injection. And you can see the beautiful healing after six weeks of implantation. So angiography, again, proves that there is actually evidence of angiogenesis. So similar study published by the tech group, this is a whole Japanese group, therapeutic angiogenesis by cell transplant and published in Lancet in 2002 about uh, this, uh, this novel innovation of using the bone marrow cell to increase the blood vessel in the peripheral limbs. So then this is actually the, our, some of the beginning cases done so all of them in the all seven cases have this improvement in all parameters. So now the question is, we could form the new blood vessel, but are they functional? If they are non-functional, maybe these are useless. So to address this question, actually this bone, uh, the endothelial function was tested. 
So you can see that after bone marrow MNC implantation, all of the, the patients have a beautiful endothelial function improvement, but the smooth muscle dependent vasodilatation, there was a no, no uh, apparent changes. So that means uh, the bone marrow MNC implantation can improve the functional improvement in this, uh, those cases. So then we did the, the long-term outcome analysis at the end of the fourth uh, year, uh, four-year analysis, four-year outcome. So you can see that actually the atherosclerotic PAD and the uh, peripheral arterial disease and Barger's disease, this is also another kind of peripheral arterial disease. I think many of the medical doctors here knows that those who are a smoker and then generally they are young people and generally uh, they can end up with the amputation. So interestingly, this bone marrow uh, MNC implantation induced a beautiful major amputation free survival among these Barger's disease with bone marrow. However, the atherosclerotic PAD patients have relatively lower, but without MNC implantation, of course, all of them have the leg amputation. So, so now the, we put into them into the, uh, the Cox regression hazard model to analyze the factors. So there were cases who have diabetes mellitus and end stage renal failure. Uh, actually, this, in these cases, bone marrow MNC was not at all, not successful in the initial studies, according to the initial studies. So if we look at the Barger's disease cumulative survival, they have the better cumulative survival. Of course, they are younger and atherosclerotic patients, those uncle, aunties, of course, they are older. So actually, many of them uh, died. Uh, the overall survival has deteriorated. So actually, this, this major amputation free survival also deteriorated in a sense. So, so now, the, if we compare all, all those uh, cases, so Barger's disease with bone marrow, uh, MNCI have a, all of, or without bone marrow MNC implantation, all of them have good survival, whereas atherosclerotic PAD with bone marrow MNC implantation have really did a better survival compared to the uh, without bone marrow MNC. Maybe they had the food, they could, they also participated in physiotherapy and some exercise that could have been contributed as well. So now this is actually the whole Japan outcome. Those uh, who, uh, with uh, Barger's disease and atherosclerotic peripheral arterial disease. So you can see that actually atherosclerotic peripheral arterial disease have low, relatively lower, uh, similar like the, our, so it was published in American Heart Journal, this study. So uh, atheros, you can see from here that atherosclerotic PID have actually relatively lower, uh, the major amputation free survival as expected and compliance with our own study as well. So now the question is uh, how, uh, because how sustainable is this bone marrow MNC implantation at the end of long-term analysis? So to address this, because the, uh, the, the Burgess disease case, we already know that they are sustainable. They are, uh, you know, the major amputation free survival is actually sustainable. But to, what about this atherosclerotic PAD cases? So to address this question, we have done a long-term outcome analysis and recently we published in scientific reports. So... Uh, you can see that actually uh, these are the baseline characteristics of those uh, those patients, and you can see that with bone marrow MNC implantation, actually have a very uh, around 60 per 60 percent, uh, you know the the uh, survival at five and ten years, uh, ten year survival uh, after after the bone marrow MNC implantation. So compared to the inter con historical control. Actually, the, the bone marrow MNC implantation was successful at the end of a, so uh, six to 16 years of total follow-up, and it was median follow-up around 10 years. So you can see that that suggests that actually bone marrow MNC implantation is useful to actually treat the cases of uh, 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 chronic critical ischemia, uh, forcing all of our all our surgeons and orthopedicians to do so many amputations around the globe. So if you look at the overall survival, actually overall survival wise, bone marrow MNC implantation and historical control was actually, uh, there was a non-significant difference, but bone marrow MNC implantation have been relatively better advantage. So again, the, we look at the etiology of the death, actually bone marrow MNC implantation group have higher death. Actually, if there is a not higher death, maybe the, the car will be a lot uh, relatively better because it's the overall survival overall major amputation free survival when the patient died actually the survival also fall down so 
So after after we conducted this uh, bone marrow based stem cell derived cell therapy, there are many many meta analysis has been done, and most of the study actually show the efficacy find the some efficacy of this bone marrow uh, derived stem cell therapy. So uh, the so we can conclude that actually the bone marrow impl MNC implantation could be an effective a way of angiogenesis, and uh, it improves leg blood flow, transcutaneous oxygen pressure and pain-free working time, bone marrow MNC implantation improves endothelial function, bone marrow MNC implantation reduces major input amputation rate and is safe and effective in patients with uh, chronic critical limb ischemia. Patients with Barger's disease has superior outcome compared to atherosclerotic uh, peripheral arterial disease and long-term outcome of bone marrow MNC implantation among the patients with uh, atherosclerotic obliterance is actually promising. But of course, we need to do the, the uh, study with more patients number and uh, to, to address all those and, and further long-term follow-up maybe would be interesting to see uh, among those populations. So with this, I conclude here. Thank you so much for listening to me. Okay. Uh, very interesting topic, doctor. Thanks yeah. for the presentation. And uh, this is the last presentation in session one for uh, session one and before we take a break i will open a discussion session uh, if anyone want to ask please unmute or chat the box chat the box uh, there is a wait there is a question yes from Hari to uh, Prof. Monirudin. Okay, so let me answer this question. Yes. Uh, does how about autologous stem cell from patients who are old and have a lot of morbidities? Does it uh, affect the proliferative potential from stem cell? Actually, uh, uh, Mr. Hari or Dr. Hari, right? Yeah, thanks a lot for your very interesting question. So actually, autologous stem cell from uh, patients who are old and have a lot of morbidity, there is actually a challenge to collect because this procedure we do under general anesthesia because we use the bone marrow mononuclear cell. So actually, there is a challenge to uh, collect the, the harvest the bone marrow. There is actually the challenge and uh, the proliferative potential, as you say, that proliferative potential wise, actually the bone marrow derived mononuclear cell might be inferior compared to the bone marrow derived mesenchymal stem cell. But why we still use the bone marrow mononuclear cell? Because it is very safe. There is a no ex vivo uh, extra, uh, no laboratory procedure. It's a closed circuit. So it's like the blood transfusion. You know, the, it's your own blood given to you, given to the patient back. So that's the beauty. So but in a sense, actually, if the oh, patient yeah. has a uh, good performance status, still we can uh, get a uh, system between this harvesting. Day. And proliferative potential, uh, it, it actually, the, of course, with aging, everything is affected. So, but in our study, we can see that you, we have used the patients with, I still remember the 85 years old grandpa always coming with food. And actually, we have done these cases, and it was very useful for him. Uh, in that age as well. So definitely with aging, maybe the proliferative potential might be affected, uh, but it's a matter of research and study. So, but in our patient population, we have done even the 83, 84 years old patients we also done because of the, you know, the Japanese people have very good performance status that that could be the reason we could, we could proceed with. So any? There's a question again. Oh, I see, okay. Uh, our stem cell can live in its chemical condition? Actually, the, if you look back, can I bring back the, the slides? I think that let me bring back my one of the slides. So if you look back, This is actually, I, I am really appreciate your deep interest, Mr. Hari and Dr. Hari. So actually, this is the experiment. If you have time, you can quote this science. 
and actually you can see that this is autologous uh, uh, autologous rabbit model that means one of the artery of the rabbit femoral artery is blocked to produce ischemia and and you can see that the stem cells are collected uh, in that in that place but of course with human human subject we really cannot do the biopsy like this so we don't have the proper uh, proof about this but actually in the autologous rabbit model that can be uh, mimicking human body human system so it show, shows that actually they can collect in the site of the ischemic site so that means the stem cell can lie in the ischemic condition and they, this is the thing the response mechanism stem cell come into the uh, that site and help to uh, develop the, the actually it's a endothelial progenitor cell uh, that actually develops the help to develop this uh, 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 vascularity so it's, I think there's still the question, uh, questions are pending, right? Yes, Prof. Thank you, Prof. Okay. Yeah. yeah. There, uh, there is uh, several um, questions from Dr. Harry. Mm -hmm. There is, uh, again, our stem cell can, uh, uh, sorry, um, where, where is it? Uh, in critical limb ischemic, uh, should we more uh, focus on artery genesis uh, rather than angiogenesis or both? Actually, uh, Hari, thanks a lot again for your question. Actually, arteriogenesis we are not doing. It's actually capillary level correction. It's a, that's why the stem cell is useful because big artery, still we need to use this uh, artery graft, you know, blood vessel graft, this artificial blood vessel we need to use. So in some cases, you can, we can use the both. In our study, we also have done the same thing. Maybe femoral artery, you cannot correct with this stem cell. So you need this uh, artificial vessel. At the same time, you need to correct the peripheral vasculature, that means the capillary to keep the patients ongoing. So with injection, patient will, patient will have better limb cell base. So uh, have you got the answer? Yeah, yes. Yes. yes, thank you, Prof. Okay, so... Uh, there is another question I can see. What your opinion about micro RNA delivered by hydrogel or exosome for critical limb ischemia? Actually, I have not done exper experiment in this area. It could be very amazing, actually. Uh, I, I, I have no idea because as I have not done this. So, uh, yes, it could be actually uh, uh, in a future topic. Thank you so much. Thank you, Prof, from explanation. The explanation really can I'm help. I'm so sorry uh, that this one I cannot explain. Oh, yeah. No problem, Prof. Thank you. Yeah, maybe there is a last uh, question for Dr. Uh, Prof. Prof. Yes. Uh, what is, uh, considering the various stem cells may be included in M and C, is there any uh, adverse event to more uh, formation observe following the M MNC administration? It's an excellent question, Rice. Rice, uh, Rice, right? Dr. Rice, excellent question, actually. So I appreciate your thoughtfulness. Actually, science is science. It should go through evidence, not just by our talk. So as we are involved in so many years on using the bone marrow MNC, fortunately, there is a no um, adverse effect to report, maybe. Uh, patient might complain some, you know, we have poked with so many uh, needles, patient might have a little bit pain in the, uh, during, after, after this procedure. Other than this, we don't see any, uh, you know, any, any, uh, uh, any adverse effect. But when you do this, uh, you know, the procedure, so one of the carefulness I, we need to do that, please don't poke in the tendon, you know, if you poke the tendon, you see our design, uh, designed to do this. Sorry, sometimes I'm struggling to bring it. Okay. So if you see our design, we avoid the tendon, you know. We don't uh, poke directly into the bone. So if you poke into the bone and tendon, patient will be painful. Other than this, actually, no serious adverse effect in this, uh, those cases. Because it's like your own blood is given back to you. So what adverse effect you expect? But there is actually the, the clinical case report with, uh, you know, the, when the embryonic stem cell was used for some cases, there is actually the clinical case report of teratoma formation. So 
uh, but bone marrow MNC, as it is actually uh, not that severely potential like the embryonic stem cell. So, so far, uh, we don't expect any kind of uh, serious adverse event, event uh, if we are careful. Uh, as I mentioned, that you should not poke into the uh, tendon, you should not poke into the bone, you know, you should follow the ar arterial line, then it will be very, very safe. This uh, needle pain, it will disappear after one, two hours. Patient will be... Uh, after day one, patient will say that I don't have any pain. Generally, it was like that. Have you got your answer, uh, Dr. Rice? Yes, thank you for the explanation. And thanks a lot for your question. Okay, maybe a question from uh, Dr. Rice. Rice is the last question for the first uh, session. So, uh, time to uh, break. Uh, this, uh, we, I will continue the, uh, the session. Uh, first, the 15 uh, break uh, after that session two. Yeah. Uh, if you, if the particip uh, participant want to go to bathroom or want to go to pray, is time is yours. Yeah. I hope the all the participants uh, still stay until the end of the international webinar of the day. I don't know if you're going to hear me, but how long is the break? 15 minutes. 15 minutes to break. Only 15 minutes, okay. Yes. All yes. right, thank you. Thank you. Indonesia as a nation with 260 million inhabitants systems in producing good human resources for human welfare. Makassar is the province of South Sulawesi, which is well known as the fifth largest city, also becoming the area of Indonesian development in economic sector. Makassar as a center of South Sulawesi province consists of different races and tribes, become an open and tolerant city of various cultures. Bosua Corporation it's one of the leading companies in East Indonesia, comes forward to fulfill the industrial needs since 1973 in automotive, mining, energy, financial, property, media, transportation, logistics, health, and education. Bosua Company, since 2013, initiatively contribute to the development of human resources in East Indonesia in which this initiative was came to realization with the establishment of Bosoa Education. Bosoa University was established in 1986 under Andi Sose Foundation and officially transferred to Bosoa Education Management with total 12,000 active students and 26,000 alumni. Among 100 top universities in Indonesia, Bosowa University provides opportunity for students to continue their higher education in nine faculties. Economic, social and politics, agriculture, engineering, letters, law, teacher and education department, psychology and medical 26 undergraduate programs
seven postgraduate programs. And one doctoral program. Bosua University is not only focused on monologue lectures in the empowerment of practical skills, as well as students' knowledge improvement in society and to contribute to economic development implementing information-based technology and education system. Put forward global insight for alumni to result skillful human resource for industries. In here, we are free to exchange ideas between students and lecturers. We are free to express our talents and interests. Study at Boswell University provides different experience for me. Here, we are given by the opportunity to learning in several industries and also uh, several universities. We are required to be creative, blend with the development of the era, to give the best innovation from hard work. Facilitate students to develop their talent and interest in Bosowa University and provide space for creativity and productivity, both academic and non-academic field. To improve three pillars in high education, which is known as three Dharma, Bosowa University works together with private companies, government, and education institution within an overseas level. Welcome to Celltech Stem Cell Center. We're a company that specializes in therapies, research, development, and production of stem cells. We are here to make an impact in the world. Hundreds of millions of mesenchymal stem cells at a time. Using quantum close system, the latest and safest in stem cell technology in the world. We are the only stem cell center that is accredited by the World Council of Preventive Medicine and recognized by 74 countries in the world. We're also approved by the Indonesian Ministry of Health and the Indonesian FDA. Using digital technology, stem cell numbers and quality are determined more accurately. Yes, we don't compromise quality. This is revolutionary. Quantum stem cell using closed system, which can proliferate stem cells 100 to 300 times faster than conventional methods. Only a few in the world and the first in Southeast Asia. We are Celtech Stem Cell Center. 
We are ready for the revolution in preventive, regenerative, and anti-aging medicine. The best for your family, choose Celtech. Your health is your wealth. Professor Dr. Debbie Vinsky, President of the World Council of Preventive, Regenerative and Anti-Aging Medicine, shares the ultimate anti-aging therapy, which is stem cell therapy. What is stem cell therapy? Stem cell therapy is a form of regenerative medicine designed to repair damaged cells within the body by reducing inflammation and modulating the immune system. This phenomenon makes stem cell therapy a viable treatment option for a variety of medical conditions. Stem cell therapies have been used to treat diabetic, cerebral palsy, autoimmune diseases, orthopedic conditions, and traumatic injuries with studies conducted on use for Crohn's disease, multiple sclerosis, lupus, COPD, dementia, Alzheimer Parkinson's, cancer, and more. And stem cells also for men vitality and female rejuvenation. While stem cell therapy does not necessarily provide a cure for these conditions, the premise is to allow the body to heal itself well enough to mitigate the symptoms of the requirements for long periods. In many cases, this effect can substantially increase the quality of life for patients. Celtech International Stem Cell Center at Vinsky Tower Jakarta, Indonesia. Vinsky Tower is a 10th floor luxury building with a helipad facility at the top. Celtech uses the newest technology, which is quantum stem cell and closed system, which is only a few in the world and will give optimum results in the quality and quantity of the stem cell. You also can keep your stem cell at our bank stem cell for 21 years and can be used anytime when you need it. All patients will enjoy the therapy in our presidential suite at Quantum Priority Floor, and the family can enjoy the penthouse with beautiful orchid and bougainville garden located within our Vinsky Tower Jakarta, Indonesia. Patients are under constant supervision from both our medical director and the supporting medical team. We will administer over 300 million cells that are all thoroughly tested for viability before treatment. These cells are exceptionally safe. Patients will be able to travel the following day. We are looking forward to welcoming you at Celtech International at Vinsky Tower Jakarta. Call now for a free consultation.
Hello, I'm Dr. Ibrahim Ashkar, an ENT and plastic surgeon from Beirut, Lebanon. The inventor of the bone injector and Ashkar typograph in rhinoplastic surgery and a board member of the World Council of Anti-Aging Medicine Paris. I am known for my long time work in rhinoplasty, fat graft, nanofat and stem cell. It is my pleasure and honor to participate in this international webinar as a speaker. I want to congratulate our President of the World Council of Anti-Aging Medicine in Paris, Professor Dr. Debbie Vinsky and President of Bosowa University and Dr. Marheim, the Dean of Faculty of Medicine of Bosowa University for this international webinar, The Cutting Edge of Anti-Aging and Stem Cell Technology. Thank you. Hi, I'm Dr. Sonia Rahbani, WCPM Board of Lebanon and CEO of Derma Pro Anti-Aging Center. Congratulations to our beautiful President of World Council of Preventive and Anti-Aging Medicine, Paris, Professor Debbie Vinsky, and the President of the, and the Dean of Faculty of Medicine of Kosovo University in Indonesia for the International Seminar of Anti-Aging and Stem Cell. Congratulations also to Celtech Stem Cell Bank and Laboratory. Thank you and hope this collaboration will give us more hope to promote the well-being and to reverse aging. Thank you. Hello, everybody. I'm Professor Elena Baranova, Monaco. Happy to be with you today. And first of all, congratulations to our dear Professor D. Bivinsky, the president of the World Council of Anti-Aging Medicine and the president of the Bosova University. That means stop the video first. Thank you. Our webinar is about to begin. Uh, welcome again in International Webinar Medical Faculty of Bosova University. I uh, will open a uh, second uh, session. Before I open the second session, uh, please to keep of uh, sound functional during webinar, please mute yourself when you are not sharing. And now without uh, further ado, we will turn time, uh, turn time over to first presenter at, at the second session. I will invite uh, Prof. Dr. Debbie Susanti Padavinsky, MSG, uh, PhD. Prof. Debbie is a uh, owner of Celtech uh, Stem Cell Center, Laboratory and Banking, Finsky Tower and Perfect Beauty uh, Clinic, owner of, owner of Finsky Mukti Arta Bank and President of World Council of Preventive Medicine, uh, WOCPM, Paris, with uh, seven, 74 countries members. Uh, Prof. Debbie uh, in elementary school until senior high school in Makassar. Uh, after that, uh, medical faculty of uh, uni, uh, uni, Universitas of Samratulangi and the education, uh, the last education is a doctor program at Saint but uh, Peters Brock Institute of uh, Bioregulation and Gerontology, Russia. And to Prof. Debbie, time is yours, Prof. Thank you very much, moderator, uh, Dr. Rahma. Very good introduction, Dr. Rahmawati. And good afternoon. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. To all professors, doctors, and all the scientists, thank you for the organizer. Congratulations to Bosoa University the president and the secretary, my very good friend from uh, SMA Negeri Satu Makassar, Dr. Hadija, and also the dean, my good friend, the dean, Dr. Marhen Harjo. I will start my presentation today. Please share. The presentation today
the advanced medicine in anti-aging therapy. And today I will speak in general and especially about peptide bioregulator and quantum stem cell for a regenerative and anti-aging medicine. The outline of, of this uh, speaking is about introduction to regenerative anti-aging medicine, the secret and the study about peptide bioregulator for the skin and what is this quantum stem cell, even though in the previous speaker already speak about the quantum technology. And what is the first step? Just, I see many, many doctors wants to be in anti-aging medicine here. Many friends join, thank you very much. And what is the first step and combination of peptide bioregulator and quantum stem cell, and then conclusion and take home message. Anti-aging medicine definition is a multidisciplinary approach on the application of advanced scientific and medical technology for early detection, prevention, treatment, and this is the evidence-based medicine. And we are not working alone, but working together with many specialty. The first step is initial diagnosis should be made. And the nine secret of body rejuvenation in anti-aging medicine is about balanced diet, regular exercise, management of mental stress, because According to so many research, stress can cause 30 to 40% of the disease. Nutrition, vitamins, wellness medical spa, and quantum medicine, hormonal restoration, telomere-based therapy, peptide bioregulator, which is we're gonna speak specifically today, and quantum stem cell transplantation. Here, speaking about hormone restoration, there is so many kinds of hormones and the most popular in HPA axis is human growth hormone. I call it the queen of all hormones because this hormone has so many target organs in the body, consists of 191 chain amino acid. Here we can see the decline of AGH and IGF-1 during aging process when the 10 to 20 years old is very high level and then going down 40 to 50 years old. That's why when we come to age 30, 40, 50, we easy to get tired, bad mood, libido going down, very easy to get upset, etc. An immune system difficult to sleep. That's actually the sign of the decline of AGS. That's why I call it my favorite, our favorite hormone in the aging medicine, beside all the hormones. And we, if we treat the hormones, we have to treat everything. It's like harmony of the music. And the good news of this. Some hormones already have bioidentical hormones. Is it almost the same? No, it's exactly the same what the body produces, and we don't use synthetic hormones. And here you can see why stress can cause many problems. And about nutrition, example, vitamin C. Vitamin C not only make beautiful skin, help the fibroblast, etc., but also the production of NK cell or natural killer cell, and it can block inflammation. The most popular vitamin during the COVID-19 is vitamin D3. So give effect, not only prevent osteoporosis, but also increase immunity and also good for muscle and the bone, of course. We are talking about the peptide bioregulator. My research in St. Petersburg, Russia, is about how peptide rejuvenate the skin, not only the skin, but also for the wellness. The study aim is to see the effect of synthesized small peptides. As everybody know, peptide is from amino acid. But here we are talking about the short peptides. The short peptides is increased gene activity and slowing down the aging process, improving quality of life and also restoration of organ and tissue functionality. And of course, improve cell function and increase the telomere, the length of telomere. My research objects many years ago is about organotopic culture isolated from young and elderly rats. And the second one is from human dissociated fibroblast cultures isolated from the skin in parotid region. This is what we use in organotopic culture as a model study is 2,500 explant totally. And I divide it by four groups. The first is control, the second AB17D peptide I use, and then the third is 
T38 tripeptide and epitalon tetrapeptide and put everything in the culture and check it in immunocytochemical analysis. This is the organotopic culture as a model of study. As we can see, we measure the central zone, intermediate zone, and the growth area. Dissociated culture as a model study, the one we take from the skin in human parotid region, we divide it to the group, we put it in the culture medium, and then give amazing result at the end. I do this research around six to nine months. The result is collagen one expression in fibroblast culture. It's amazing that three T38 tripeptide working the most wonderful in all culture. So if you use the peptide, you can use as injection or medicine or the oral, the best in all cultures. So the older the people, the result is even getting bet better. So professor, doctor, there is a hope we're getting younger with this uh, tripeptide. T38 because better result than the control or the young uh, culture. This is the T38 tripeptide impact on a sirtuin gene expression. I'm very interested in this, the gene sirtuin 6 because as we already know that sirtuin gene it's very wonderful because it's a multiple molecular pathway related to aging including DNA repair, telomere maintenance, glycolysis and anti-inflammation. The result also in immunocytochemistry and skin and plants, you can see this is very good result. Make the skin growing younger and also the wellness for the people. The summary of peptide bioregulator study in the definition of the skin, it show after we use the D T3 and tetrapeptide regulate such a basic cellular processes as proliferation and program cell death in the skin. Cell proliferation enhancement is implemented by reducing the intensity of apoptosis and the efficacy of low concentrate small peptide. Why I call small peptide? Because the measurement is 0.05 nanogram per milliliter. And when stimulated proliferation process on the skin, is close to an action of biological active ultradose and proliferative activity against skin cells identified in the synthesized peptide is a significant fact that will allow the future to conduct a correction aim to slow down the aging process and also for the wellness. Here, I like to show you the table about how peptide increase the protein synthesis in red hepatocyte. Hepatocyte like 39 to 173%, it's amazing. And this publication already made all over the world. And Professor Kavinson is have so many patent and Prof Anisimov. I met them personally because Professor Kavinson is my professor in uh, St. Petersburg in Russia. And it show also the amount of heterochromatin in lymphocyte of elderly people Increase by 42.4%. It's meaning increase also sirtuin gene 6. And the number of deficient of human cell. How amazing. I, I'm, I was interested in the beginning before I come to see Professor Kaffeeston in St. Petersburg 15 years ago. When I see his presentation in Paris, how this peptide bioregulator can increase the average length of telomere 2.4 folds. Because when I start anti-aging medicine, I already start to measure the telomere of my patient. And at the end of therapy, six months, I measure again the length of telomeres. And some people ask, it can increase cancer accidents or tumor? The answer is no, because if so many research has been done, 3.1 fold decrease in tumor incidence. So peptide by regulator, it's, I think it's quite amazing for the advanced uh, technology for anti-aging uh, medicine. And it, this is also why Celtex is, MO, first MOU is with Hospital Derma is Cancer Hospital in Jakarta. And don't forget, the world is nothing without women, but also without a man. So 
if we practice our patient, we also have to practice men vitality program. In many centers in the world, we mission of testosterone, quantum stem cell, and peptide biorregulator. As you can see, the signs and symptoms of low testosterone is decreased sexual desire, loss of energy, depression, also low bone mineral density, increased body fat. That's why men have metabolic syndrome, their weight is oh, yeah. above 100 centimeters, and also reduce the muscle bulk. If you see your patient, atrophy is, is even not patient. Maybe we can see ourselves if we are a man and this is the symptoms. It means you start to need the anti-aging therapy beside other therapy from your other specialty. Now I want to move to talking about, to talk about quantum technology. Many doctors come to me and ask, you talk about stem cell quantum technology, what is quantum? Has already speak my previous speaker, Professor Elena and Professor Eric, He's my fellow professor teaching in Master of Anti-Aging Medicine in Barcelona, FA International University. Quantum technology is not new because in 19, 1918, 19th century, Max Planck awarded the Nobel Prize in Physics for the mm -hmm. of the yeah. So if you can see like, the uh, telephone and handphone, handphone is also one of the simple example of quantum. We don't use cable, but there is a quantum energy. This is the quantum stem cell. Hello. So we're not speaking about the, the, the brand of the technology. Maybe you can uh, mute the, <laughs> the quantum stem cell. We are talking about the technology already founded a Nobel Prize in 1918, the quantum technology, which is increased 100 to 300 times more the amount of the stem cell, mesenchymal stem cell, we produce and without decreasing the quality of the stem cells. So with the aging process, the stem cell also will have aging. When we are born, we are young, it's 100 trillion of stem cell we have, but with aging process, we decrease. That's why many people need to have the stem cell, either they are sick or only for wellness or rejuvenation. Here, the traditional cell culture, which is many times and more often used in the world. The quantum technology, only two in Southeast Asia, and one maybe from the Dr. Mahan uh, University also, and one in uh, Indonesia with the cell tech, the quantum machine, without speaking about the brand, because there's so many brands in the world, but in Asia, so far until today, it's only, only two to make sure the quality and fast process for the mesenchymal stem cell. Here you can see the traditional cell culture, which is using manual workflow. It can take two weeks to two months only to produce a few hundred thousand to a million of the stem cell. We use the safety cabinets and using people, depend on people who do it. So it's also very sensitive to human error. This is we call open system. And the advanced technology, the world now moved to quantum workflow, which is closed system, everything doing in the closed system. From cell seeding, frozen, and this is only take one or two weeks, you can produce 100 to 300 million times. So example, if you produce before 1 million and you put it in the machine of the quantum medicine technology, after two weeks, it will produce like 300 million. It depends. It depends to the sources of the cell, like talking by our professor Monir before. So it depends. If you take it from umbilical cord for a young baby, of course, it's going to be much uh, better compared to from adult. But with quantum technology, we can have the sources from bone marrow, uh, adipose, or either from umbilical cord or hematopoietic. The stem cell center laboratory, or Usual have laboratory and bank, but not many has both in Indonesia. And I want to show, uh, this is international webinar, but some doctor is from Indonesia. Please be aware because many doctors and professor doesn't know about this, that the old rule is in 2014, uh, the, the paper is number 32, 2014, is 11 hospital can do it. But that's 2014, now the new rules, from the government, the Minister of Health is 
2018 is nine stem cell laboratory have the permission and can do it in primary clinic and hospital. So not anymore to 11 hospitals, not anymore. It's the old rules. Yeah, now the new rules is already changed. And of course, thanks God that the laboratory stem cell, we have both laboratory and bank stem cell permit from Ministry of Republic of Indonesia. I come to the conclusion about the advanced medicine in anti-aging therapy, no single bullet in anti-aging and regenerative therapy. The first, you have to make sure the patient have healthy lifestyle. And this is what I like about anti-aging medicine, that you practice not only to your patient, but we can practice to ourselves. Make sure anti-aging doctor of doctor in regenerative medicine and stem cell, we have healthy lifestyle, no smoking, mm, regular exercise, mild or endurance, just exercise you like. And you cannot avoid stress. What we can do, the most I lost it because I talked to some the management of mental stress. We have to manage our stress. And then macro and micronutrients, like Professor Elena, my friend, before talking about nutrigenomic. And relax, do the wellness and medical spa. It's important for your life. And the quantum medicine, like Professor Eric. Professor Eric is the professor in quantum medicine. And number seven is hormonal restoration. Before the patient come, you have to balance their diet, but also check the wellness, the hormonal level in the body from testosterone, IGF-1, DHEA, dehydroepiandrosterone. If you lack of this hormone, you feel fatigued, tired, wake up in the morning, capek banget, lelah. Baru bangun sudah lelah. And kalau capek karena capek, itu maybe DHEA deficiency. And if you remember something, like many people because of COVID, they have brain fog, make sure you have enough pregnenolone, hormone of the brain, 50 to 100 milligrams. This is will help your great grandmother of your or your old patient to remember again. And melatonin, melatonin is produced by pineal gland in our brain. It can produce hormone of sleep. So it's not uh, make you dependent to pills, but this is make you sleep, but make sure you have enough light in the morning and dark in the evening. And in the morning, melatonin will produce serotonin, calm hormone, hormone of ketenangan. That's why people who doesn't have enough sleep, easy to get upset, cannot focus, forgetful, bad mood. Make sure you have sleep. One third of our life, we need to sleep. T3 to T4, so I'm talking about natural thyroid. Because when our children or our patient, young patient have hypothyroid, very difficult to wake up in the morning. And in the evening, very difficult to sleep. They have lack of energy. So make sure you check this hormone, not high level, but low. In the, in the low deficiency, you can improve. I call it hormonal restoration, not hormonal replacement. Let the endocrinologist do that. So... And the most popular, don't forget the men vitality program, because not only women has problem menopause, but men also has a problem, which is andropause. When men become andropause, they become like a woman. They talk a lot, they complain a lot, they're sensitive, and they like to see uh, many beautiful girls, because that increase their hormone, because it's too low. Actually, if their testosterone high enough, it's enough to see the beautiful wife beside you you already have good hormone. So make sure have good level because anti-aging medicine is to increase the harmony in the marriage. That's why I like anti-aging medicine. And peptide bioregulator. And number nine is stem cell transplantation. And I suggest autologous closed system. Talking about the future of anti-aging medicine will involve manipulating genes, increasing utilization of stem cell with advanced technology like quantum and targeted delivery of nutrients, nutrigenomic and drug using nanotechnology. And some country already start with stem cells, 3D printing organs. So all professor, doctor, scientists, we have to renew and updating our knowledge. And that's why I'm very happy when Dr. Meyerheim invite and have initiating this international webinar, because with this, we can exchange knowledge around the world. When we exchange our knowledge, we know what is the latest. Why this? This is very important because the principle of ubiquitous concept is the present anywhere in the same instant. Like uh, Dr. Marian explained about the society of 
5.0 because output of technology can spread data with the speed of light, 300,000 kilometers per second. That's why we need this to do more often, Dr. Marhan and Bosoa University. And we are open to work together with other university in the world. And this is, we will work together with many universities, including Bosoa in University. If you want to know more, you can study Master of Preventive Regenerative and Medicine, actually now with outline program, one and a half years. This is online, but you have to do the thesis in Barcelona. And nobody rejects to come to Barcelona. It's a beautiful city, like Makassar, but in Europe, in different style. <laughs> I born in Makassar, so I love Makassar very much. This is my references, if, if you want to know more about this presentation. And thank you very much again. The future of anti-aging medicine, the future is now and update your knowledge always and stay update. Anti-aging doctor, regenerative doctor and preventive doctor must be a model for the patient. Good luck to all of you, healthy lifestyle and always good looking. Thank you for your attention. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Good morning, good afternoon to the, all the scientists all over the world. I give back to moderator, Dr. Rahmawati Tambun. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much uh, for the sharing uh, the topic about anti-aging, Prof. I'm also very interested uh, in anti-aging, especially for aging male, Prof, because I'm an androgist. I do. Uh, <laughs> yeah, thank you once again, Prof. Thank you. Uh, before I move to the second presentation, Presenter, to all participants, please type your question into the chat box and we, uh, we will uh, answer it in the last uh, of session. Uh, to be move to presenter, the second presenter is uh, Prof. Reinhold. Prof. Reinhold is joined, have a join with us. Hello, yes, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, yes. I can hear you, Prof. Yes. Uh, uh, okay. Before. So apologies. I thought I thought my slot was at eleven. So I just joined. So let me see if everything is working here. Um, okay, Prof. Before you present uh, your topic, I would like to uh, uh, read your CV. Uh, the second presenter uh, is uh, Prof. Reinhold G. Medina, MD. Medical, medical doctor PhD from Queen's uh, University Belfast in United Kingdom. Prof. Uh, Reinhold is professor of diabetes and vascular medicine at Queen's University Belfast and diabetes and vascular stem cell research group leader. Uh, Prof. Reinhold is original from Peru and where he completed his medical training and obtained his medical doctor from San Agustin. Agustin University, uh, Areguipa in 2000. Yes, uh, please, uh, time is yours, Prof. Can you see my screen? Yes, Prof. And I will minimize this. Okay. Yes, can you see my screen now? Yes, yes. Okay, so um, first of all, I would like to um, congratulate Osawa University for their 10, 35 year anniversary. Um, and I would also like to thank um, Dr. Marjair Hanjo for the hard work and organization of this international um, webinar. So in the next um, 10 minutes, 10, 15 minutes, I will um, chat to you about our work in Belfast we are doing in terms of repairing blood vessels. Um, um, so just as a disclosure, I I'm a founder and scientific advisor for um, the company Bas Versa uh, Limited, who is looking into trying to bring these therapies into, into patients. Um, So um, in terms of um, what I'm going to talk about, uh, first I'm going to give you a background on um, what um, are our approaches to use cells as medicine um, to repair blood vessels. Um, then I'm going to um, 
talk about specifically about cells um, that uh, differentiate into endothelial cells that we call EPCs. And finally, a very specific cell type that we are concentrated, which is the ECFC, which is the cells that you see there um, on your left. Um, so what you see here um, is that, um, what you see here um, is that there is a really a clinical need for repairing blood vessels. Um, and by that, I mean, um, when you look at heart disease, stroke, limb amputations, um, all these diseases in common have ischemia, which is mainly due to lack of blood vessels. So there is a need for therapies that regenerate, repair blood vessels. And by that, I mean everything, capillaries, arteries, and veins. Um, not only ischemic diseases, but also diabetes. Diabetes is considered a vascular disease. Um, as you can see in this um, diagram, all the complications of diabetes are associated with blood vessel dysfunction. So whether it's um, problems in the heart, in the kidney, or in the eye, it's all these complications of diabetes are because um, dysfunction in our blood vessels. Um, and it's mainly triggered by ischemia. Um, and therefore, it's not only ischemic diseases, but also diabetes that will have, um, will have probably an impact if we can develop a cell therapy. So what are endothelial progenitor cells? Endothelial progenitor cells um, are these cells that we call EPCs that circulate in blood and they have the capacity to differentiate into endothelial cells. So they can become the cells that line our blood vessels, line up um, our blood vessels. Now, these cells are very rare in circulation. Um, we don't know where they come from. Most people will say they come from the bone marrow. Um, more recent paper says that there is a niche in the actual blood vessel wall. Uh, but irrespective of where they come from, we can, we can actually isolate them from circulating blood. Um, so um, we, we can isolate them and take them out from circulating blood. Um, when this research started, um, the first paper was over 20 years ago now um, in Japan, and they showed the, that um, in this um, critical limb ischemia model, so this is mouse, where they ligate the femoral arteries, um, and you can see in the Doppler, that after four weeks um, in the control groups where they injected mature endothelial cells or media, there's not much uh, reperfusion. When you inject these cells in four weeks, you see significant um, revascularization and perfusion of the ischemic limb, which is significant. After that study, there was a clinical trial, a first in human trial, um, in the, that was published in The Lancet in 2002, where a handful of patients were treated, and these patients were going into amputation, but before amputation, they were treated with this cell therapy, and some of them um, have uh, actually a, a significant benefit. In some of them, there was clear reperfusion of those uh, feet, and, uh, feet and, and limbs. After that, there was a lot of um, hype and hope where said we're gonna change medicine with, with these cells, we're gonna repair hearts. This is the solution for um, critical limb ischemia, diabetic retinopathy, and myocardial ischemia. Unfortunately, that has not been the case um, because um, to date, there is probably close to 20 clinical trials in the heart and, and more than 12 clinical trials in, in critical limb ischemia. The first clinical trial for um, ischemic retinopathy is currently recruiting in the US, but when you do the meta-analysis, so there's already meta-analysis published for all those studies, the benefit is minimal. So even though there is some benefit, um, it's not major. So for example, um, for the critical limb ischemia, um, we were discussing last year and it was said that you would need to treat four patients to rescue one limb. So it's really not cost effective. Um, even though it helps, it's only one in four at the moment. So we really need to optimize the therapy. And there are many, many reasons why um, it's not effective in every single patient. Uh, when we assess all these meta-analysis, we realize that um, the cells people, the cells people are using are all different, the delivery routes are different, the target population are different. So there, there's many variables that will explain this, but nevertheless, one of the key reasons is the cell type. And that's what we try to address at Queens. So um, 
in, in this slide, I'll show you the, the three main ways or the three cell types that people use for these trials. So we usually use core blood or peripheral blood. We process the blood. We get rid of unwanted cells and we just work with the mononuclear cell fraction. Uh, and most groups will do um, flow cytometry based cell sorting. Well, using antibodies, you can actually take some markers and, and, and purify populations. Uh, freshly from blood, um, but you can also use cell culture approaches where using different um, growth factors, different media, different scaffolds, you can isolate different cell types. And, and these electron micrographs show, and the, also the phase contrast images show how different are cells just depending on the cell culture conditions. Um, and both have been heavily used in trials. The ones, probably the one on the top, represents 75% of the trials. Um, it's more a myeloid cell, as you can see here. Um, it looks more like a macrophage. The one in the bottom, it's, it's more um, typical of endothelial, and that's the one uh, at Queens, and we are focusing on um, developing this, that we call endothelial colony forming cell. Um, so again, here to summarize, so the flow cytometry, you can isolate. The most classical definition would be C34, BGFR2, uh, but and, and when you use cell culture, you can have cells that are CD45 positive, which are the hematopoietic cells that will be mostly myeloid and will release growth factors, or you will have CD45 negative, which are uh, mostly endothelial. So in the, in the next two, three minutes, I'll show you what some of the results we've got in Belfast using these cells, the ECFCs, endothelial colony forming cells. Um, so first of all, we isolate a population of cells, which is, um, we can define it as being very endothelial, as you see here, CD31 and Doglin and Bombillion factors are highly expressed in these cells. Uh, we can also assess its purity, as you see here, highly purity by flow cytometry for endothelial markers and less than 1% contamination of hematopoietic markers. Um, and when we can also assess the potency. So when you put these cells in a 3D hydrogel, you can actually see them forming tubes, vascular networks that have lumens within three days. So. Um, with this, we can, we can actually say we have uh, uh, the identity, very well-defined cell type, and we can test it, its purity. And actually before testing it in, in preclinical models, um, we can actually know if it's potent or not by the functional assay in the 3D hydrogen. Um, so we were the first of trying this in the scale ischemic eye. Um, so this is a model of ischemic retinopathy in the mouse. And as you can see here, um, this, green staining is blood vessels in the back of the eye in the retina. And in the model, you will see obliteration and ischemia in the central retina. Uh, and in this is the same, the same mouse, red, left and right eye. And when you inject the cell, you see the decrease of that ischemic area. And in, in this reconstruction of confocal microscopy of that same eye, you can see the cells were injected were labeled in red. And you can see the cells um, integrating into the superficial plexus of that retinal vasculature in the mouse. So um, this data, which is published, has proven that we can certainly repair and revascularize this chemic retina in the mouse. Um, we have done more testing on that in, in relation to angiography, which is what you would do in patients. And you can see here in the controls, the central retina is Black is devoid of blood vessels, but when you inject different amounts of cells, there's less black and more microvasculature, um, showing um, new formation of blood vessels in that ischemic retina. The histology confirmed that. So when you do the histology, again, on top your controls and bottom the cells treated um, retinas, and you can see that we significantly increase um, vascularization of those ischemic retinas. Um, finally, toxicity. So what happens if you inject the cells into uh, an eye which is not diseased, is not sick? Uh, are the cells toxic? So in this, we are injecting the cells intravitreally into a healthy mouse. Um, this is the lens. This is the retina. Uh, and when you see them here, you can actually see the cells uh, that within three days, the cells, if they are not needed, they actually go into apoptosis and are clear without triggering inflammation or immune 
um, an immune reaction. And when we do a very, uh, accurate, very accurate PCR um, ALU element to quantify, we can actually see that within three days, you lose um, all uh, cells. So basically, and the retinas that you see in the bottom, they are all intact without any inflammation. So if the cells are not needed, um, they are um, not toxic to the mouse retina. Um, so in summary, what you have here is we have defined a cell type, which we call ECFC, endothelial colony forming cell. It has a very strict definition, it's highly pure. We can prove its function, uh, we can deliver it um, intravitreally or systemically into the carotid artery of the mouse. Um, and we, can, we are starting to prove that really is not non-toxic in, in the retina. So what's next for, for ECFCs? Um, when you inject these cells in any ischemic tissue, um, they, there will be a hypoxic environment. So we just published um, last year a paper on making the cells resistant to hypoxia. So if you induce micro, microRNA 130A in these cells, you make them resistant to hypoxia. So we want cells that are resistant to hypoxia. Um, we also need more um, models, um, preclinical animal models of diabetes to test them. Um, and we need cells that are clinical grade, GMP grade. So we are collaborating with, um, with uh, GMP facilities to be able to generate cells that are clinical grade for potential clinical trials, that, which will be our ultimate aim. Ultimate aim will be to develop a phase one, phase two clinical trial um, using these cells. Um, and finally, I just want to thank uh, both current members and previous members of the team and the funders that make um, the research possible. Um, thank you very much for listening. Thank you, Prof, uh, for sharing this topic and thanks for finding time and attending today. Uh, stay uh, until the end, your Prof. Okay, um, I will move to uh, the last presenter of today is uh, Dr. Fernando Abarzua, medical doctor, PhD. Uh, the topic is about a robotic surgery in Paraguay. And Dr. Fernando is a specialist at Okoyama University, Japan, 2001 until 2005 PhD degree. And now Dr. Uh, Dr. Fernando is director of the robotic Uro Uro urological surgery program with his hospital, Montevideo, Uruguay, Uruguay and Doctor of Robotic Surgery in Argentina, San Sanatorio in Buenos Aires, 2000, uh, 2000, 2021 to date. And the title is uh, Advanced Medicine in Robotic Surgery. To pro, uh, Dr. Fernando, is time is yours. Please, Dr. Hi, hello. Uh, thank you very much for the invitation and for congrats for the 35 years. And thank you, Dr. Hargill, for the invitation and let me uh, make a presentation. I, I'm not sure. Can you see my slide? Not yet, no. Okay, let me see. Something wrong. Give me a second. No, okay, Vinsky. Megan, see, I'm okay, Vinsky, let me. Give me one second. Can you hear me? Yes, I hear you. Okay, give me a sec, but I'm trying to share with you screen. Don't worry, Dr. Fernando, because you wake up so early today. Time for you. All the time for you. Oh. Uh, can you see now my screen? Not yet, not yet, doctor. Okay. Yeah. Give me one second. Yes. And now? I see your screen, but there's no light in your screen, though. I'm having some problems. Let me see. 
give me one second. Yes, yes. Yes, Pinton for all of you. Dr. Fernando was around the South America yesterday from uh, can, you can you see now? Yes, already yeah. see the slide. Right. Can you see the, the presentation? Yes, I see, I see the presentation. Please, time is yours. Now. Okay, so I will start. So I will talk today about, uh, so this is a little bit more clinical. So because I'm currently on my return to my country, I'm mainly focused on, on, on surgery. As you mentioned, I'm working currently as the instructor in robotic surgery. So that's the, my current field. So we're talking about now about the robot. This is the Da Vinci system. This is a system that was developed in the United States because of the effort of the NASA and the military. It was originally intended to be used in the battlefield, so making surgery on distance. It was approved in 2000 by the FDA in the United States, and it has a multiple surgical uh, utilities in different branches. Originally, it was designed for cardiology, cardio surgery, but at the beginning, uh, urology, the field I do, was the most blessed with this technology because it becomes the basic tools from that time in the general urological practice. Currently, it is used in several branches of general surgery, gynecology, urology, and also recently in the eye surgery. So basically the robotic system, the Da Vinci is composed of three different elements. The, the, the car, the robotic car, the console where the surgeons perform the surgery and the images, the integration of the images as you can see here. There are four pillars that uh, support this technology. First, the vision, which is a uh, mag Your voice is not out. Dr. Fernando. Where are you, Fernando? This song for you. Maybe. And there is still morning. So early morning. Early morning. <laughs> Around 4 a.m. probably. Okay, Dr. Rahmawati, probably yes. Fernando yes, has a problem and you yes. can start the discussion. Yes. And uh, maybe while waiting uh, for Dr. Fernando, maybe uh, we are open uh, discussion about uh, the, uh, what the presenter, two of presenter before. Uh, so uh, there is a uh, several question in the chat box. There is uh, from Dr. Dian Pramesti, specialist andrology. Uh, how are you, Dr. Dian? Uh, Dr. Dian is my teacher. Oh. <laughs> yes, uh, Prof. Debbie, I open the uh, discussion, Prof. Yes, please. Okay. Well, let me check the question. Yes. Oh, there is a. Oh, okay, okay. Okay. Uh, Dr. Fernando. Dr. Fernando, come. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Again, Dr. Fernando. Okay, Dr. Fernando first. <laughs>
Okay, Dr. Fernando, next star, my big brother. Sorry, we cannot hear from you. Dr. Fernando, your voice not out. We don't hear your voice, Dr. Fernando. Excuse me, Doc. We not hear your voice. Yes. Sorry. Yeah, yes, yes. <laughs> okay. Yeah, welcome again. So I was, I will go back again. Sorry. So, as can you hear me now? Yes. 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 Okay. So, uh, four, five, uh, four thousand five hundred units are already operating in the world, and almost three million surgeries have been done. This is increasing annually in uh, at least twenty percent every year. Uh, as you can see in the lower part, in 2001 in the United States, almost 100% of surgeries for prostate cancer were, were done uh, openly, but currently is almost 95% to 98% of the prostate cancer are treated in the United States with the use of the robotic system. Uh, as you know, I mean, we don't have a robot still in Paraguay, so I'm traveling since 2015, the time when I returned to my country, to Uruguay, where we are doing a robotic surgery. One of the organs that we basically use and for one of the diseases is prostate cancer, and basically because of the location of the gland very deep in the, in the pelvis, uh, which makes the surgery very smooth when we compare it with, against open surgery, and also with laparoscopic surgery. So here in the slides, you can see the patient's position, the, the trockers in the abdomen of the patients, and the robot already set on the top of the patient. During, during prostate, prostate, there are several important points, and one are the control of the dorsal complex, which is a vascular, then nerve preservations for the continence and, and erectile function also. And finally, the anastomosis of the bladder with the urethra. These are the three most important steps in the, during the robotic surgery. So there's, there have been uh, the, uh, multiple analysis. And as you can see here is a comparison of the already 22,000 patients in open surgery, laparoscopic surgery, and robotic surgery, which, because it's very important when you do this kind of surgery, the, 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 the negative margins uh, during surgery. So, and when we compare all of them, robotic surgery, laparoscopic, and open surgery, you Excuse me, Doc. We're not here again. Your voice. And so the incontinence, as and as you can see here. Mm -hmm. 
Maybe uh, I can go in the place of Prof. Dr. Fernando is, is low. So maybe uh, we are open discussion okay. while waiting, while waiting uh, Dr. Fernando again. Oh, yes. <laughs> again. <laughs> okay. Yeah, yeah, okay. Mm. Keeps coming back <laughs> and go. <laughs> Can you hear me now? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Okay. Give me a second. I will go again to my presentation. Okay. So other uh, surgery we are using is for partial nephrectomies. Uh, we are currently using and there, as you can see in this slide, there is a trend mainly in the world. We are now preserving, we're preserving more renal units because of this kind of surgery. And as you can see here, every year, the numbers of partial nephrectomies are rising. So we are preserving because of the clinical implication in the long term, which are related to the renal insufficiency and also cardiac problems. Let me see if I can show you. Yeah, I will show you here. So here you can see how the, world, the robot works. This is in a small space. Space You can see the instruments are very small. We're proceeding to the clamp, the renal artery, selective uh, clamp of the renal artery. The instruments are five millimeters. So this is everything magnified. And here's when we are treating the, the, the tumor in the kidney. And this is something like uh, 3.5 centimeters. And here is where the beauty of this kind of surgery comes because you have a long range of movements. So you can do a perfect uh, treatment of the base of the, of the area that you have treated. So here there are some results when we compare partial nephrectomy. And I think the one of the most important thing is related to the ischemia time. So in general, the ischemia time of the time when we're we keep the kidney without blood supply. It's less than 20 minutes. And in general, in open surgery, on laparoscopic surgery, it exceeds uh, 30 minutes. So what awaits us? So in these days, uh, the scenario changed a lot. So in the past, urology was the most active uh, group. But as you can see here these days, gynecology and also general surgery uh, are leading the numbers in terms of cases around the world. And I would like to share with you this. This is a video. Can you see the video? Yeah. Okay. So this is a video about the new pro the new types of uh, robotics system. This is a 22 millimeter axis is a single pore, and we are currently using this for partial nephrectomies. A couple of years ago, it was like a, a dream, but it becomes a true like three years ago, and this is fantastic, as you can see. So now you can imagine a patient just with a single hole in the body through which you can do a surgery as compared with open surgery and even lapis open surgery.
And this is the last video I would like to share with you. Global life expectancy more than doubled. In the future, intuitive's focus won't only be on extending how long we live, but also on extending how well we live. Da Vinci is ready. So this is basically a new type of, uh, this is the last version of the Da Vinci. This is the Da Vinci Excite. And these are the new uh, operating rooms that uh, the company is working on. As you can see, there's the small, uh, the smart uh, OR. Uh, these are uh, basically, as you can see, this fascinating, fantastic, and we are using, and we have this technique uh, available these days for many kind of surgeries. The future is and intelligent. Definitely the future is, the future is uh, intuitive. In intelligent. So the, the robotic surgery I think will keep will keep growing and I, I think it's the next platform for any kind of surgical procedure in the future and, and now on. So thank you very much and sorry for the inconvenience uh, during the presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Fernando. Uh, the topic is very futuristic and interesting. And thank you for finding time and attending today. Uh, I know there is still early morning. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, the presenting of uh, Dr. Fernando is the last presenting day, the, the last presenter today. And we are now, we are moved to uh, session uh, last is a discussion. Uh, there is uh, several question in the uh, chat box and I will, I will read the question. Uh, first from Dr. Dian Pramesti, specialist andrology and the question to Prof. Debbie. Are there any caution, precaution, specific requirements for patient or someone before stem cell therapy? Prof. Debbie, time is yours, Prof. Yes, thank you, Dr. Rahmawati. This is a very good question. Thank you very much, Dr. Dian Pramesti. So before the stem cell therapy, of course, we have some uh, checkup we have to do to the patient. If the patient is belong to Dr. Dian Pramesti, the patient, uh, what is the diagnosis of the patient? And if you order the stem cells to the laboratory, you must say how much, uh, how many the stem cell MSC you need. And you check the blood, hematology, complete blood of the patient. And uh, I suggest also the hormonal because you andro androloid, right? And check the allergen of the patient. If the patient has uh, stem cells or umbilical cord in the bank, you saw what we do here. Some patient have their in the in the cord life Singapore, so we work together with them. They get, you can send this uh, umbilical cord. Usually, it take one or two weeks to come to Celtic Jakarta. Otherwise, you can ask for the donor. Here we have some donors, which has already been uh, screening and good for the needs of the patient. So that's I think it's not so complicated. And we will send you the form, uh, what you need. And if you not not sure how many stem cells, how many cells do you need, you can uh, consult with me <laughs> and our expert because we have a team in a stem cell. But the first, you must check the laboratory of the patient. And before you inject the patient, you make sure the patient is in the best condition. In the best condition, it's meaning if the patient is for diabetic, make sure the blood sugar is under control, make sure the patient in a healthy lifestyle, make sure the patient in the great condition because harvesting stem cell in a healthy patient, the best condition, the one they can get is much better than the one who's really sick. Thank you very much, Dr. Dian. Yes, thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Uh, Professor Devi for your clear answer. Thank you, Dr. Dian. Okay, thank you, Dr. Prof. Debbie and Dr. Dian uh, for the answer, Prof. Debbie. And there is a question to Prof. Medina. Uh, you have shown an effective incorporation of 
easy physics in in the side of injury. In the regard are the restoration effect of uh, I easy physics uh, acquired from the direct direct uh, integration with the exciting endothelial cell or there any evidence this was through paracrine factor. Yes, so Prof. Medina, time. Yeah, <clears throat> yeah so it, it's basically the question if I understood well is about the mechanism of action of the cell therapy. Um, so it has, um, can you hear me well, sorry. Yes, we hear you. Yeah, okay, so, um, so basically the main mechanism of action is cell engraftment and replacement. So there are, we have evidence both in vitro and in animal models that the ECFCs, when you inject them, they will form blood vessels, both de novo, and they will also integrate into damaged blood vessels. So there is cell engraftment and cell replacement. So that's the major main mechanism of action. Um, having said that, um, there is also many papers and evidence that the cell have a paracrine effect as the, as the person um, asked. So it, it does have a paracrine effect. The cells will secrete cytokines um, such as IL-8 um, and, and, and others um, that will promote um, angiogenesis, but the paracrine effect um, will not be as um, potent as with other cells like mesenchymal stem cells or myeloid angiogenic cells or, or macrophages. So it does have paracrine effects, but they are not, um, that's not the main role or function. The main role is um, de novo uh, cell replacement. Hopefully that addresses the question. Thank you. Okay. Uh, how about uh, Dr. Rice? Uh, there is a second question from uh, Dr. Rice. Is ischemic involvement profoundly uh, affect the therapeutic effect of ECFC? Are these cells more resistant to ischemic damage com compared to mature endothelial cells? Yes, that's a very good question. And, and the answer is yes. So we have compared um, the ECFCs, which are a progenitor of endothelial cells. We have compared them with mature cells from saphenous vein, from cells from aorta, from cells from retinal microvasculature. So when you compare differentiated cells with ECFCs, progenitors, uh, we actually found that the cells are more resilient they are more resistant, they are more angiogenic, they are more proliferative. So um, in, in those, I think there is, there is a reason why you want to use progenitors, uh, because they are superior in functionality and potency um, than mature endothelial cells. Thank you, Doc, for the answer. Uh, the last question uh, to uh, Prof Medina from Dr. Ais. As the generation of ECFC, a recurred cell culture expansion, uh, is it possible to use these cells in acute ischemic injury that recur limited time window? Um, the answer is yes, but it will be expensive. Um, so, um, there is there's two ways for, for, for cell therapies, two major, I mean, there's many, but the two major ones are autologous and allogeneic. Autologous is what the, the person is asking is, can we just, if the, if the patient has a heart attack, can we just treat it immediately? Um, the answer is yes. If we, are, if we find markers of the cells and we sort them by flow, uh, we can actually enrich cells from, from the bone marrow and inject them back to the patient as an autologous therapy. Now that is already happening in, in some trials, but it's very expensive um, uh, because it requires immediate enrichment of cells from the same patient. And there may, there may be cases where that's not possible because the patient is too sick or the patient's cells are diseased and not functional. Um, so the other approach is allogeneic where you can build cell banks um, which is a more pragmatical approach. So I think if you build cell banks of ECFCs, um, you can have them ready to use anytime and you can basically do the same as when you do core blood transplantation, you can do HLA matching, and then you have a bank of cells that when somebody has a need cells, um, you can actually ask for a match of your cell to be injected. 
Uh, I think, and in the future, uh, with IPS, ECFCs, and other technologies, uh, you may have your own cell bank. So you, in, in the future, I'm talking about 10, 20 years from now, probably you have your own cell bank. Everybody may have their own cell bank where you can go anytime if you have an urgent need for cell therapy. Thank you, Prof. Uh, how about the tries? Any question or? Thank you. Is enough? <laughs> yes. Uh, there is a last question to Prof. Debbie. Uh, maybe Prof. Debbie is a uh, have answer in the chat box. Uh, there is a uh, from Alex. My is my wife is pregnant. Can I keep my baby umbilical cord? I'm in Makassar. Is it possible? Thank you. Thank you. The answer is, uh, Dr. Alex, is very possible to keep your uh, baby umbilical cord, but you only can do it before the due date, before the baby born. So uh, very easy. You just uh, contact because we serve 34 provinces around Indonesia. And uh, you can send a letter and text to the number. We already put the number because it's very useful to have, as, as Dr. Reinhold said before, it's good to have ourselves in the baby bank. It's easy when we need it immediately, we already have, but we only can do from our child. So we can contact uh, the people in the laboratory, in this case, in the cell tech, like few months before or the latest is two times 24 hours before because we have to send you the kit. You have the kit, we contact the doctors and then the husband can bring the kids in the hospital. So when baby born, they will took the umbilical cord, we, we call it, UC or UCB. And you have to write the informed concern and make the register. There is two kinds. It's paid by uh, bank stem cell and the one it's free is donation. So you have two choices. If you, you want to keep it like for 20 to 21 years or 10 to 21 years, or you can keep it as a donation. But many, many patients uh, for their grandchild for their kids they keep it in the bank stem cell and some others already use it for the grandmother for the kidney failure and we don't do it uh, sometimes it's asking by the doctors who wants to help the grandfather the patient who has a kidney failure or heart disease the, the bank will take out the umbilical cord and the laboratory will make the production of mesenchymal stem cell and sell the amount, the dose of mesenchymal stem cell to do the doctor who ordered it. Thank you very much. I hope you're satisfied with the answer. Thank you, Dr. Rahma. Thank you, Prof. It's a very complete answer, I think, yes. Uh, maybe there is any question for the presenter? Uh, this is the last session, uh, session of the seminar, uh, webinar international from Medical Faculty of Bosco University. Uh, I hope there is an international webinar again. And we meet again, Prof. <laughs> Prof. Devi and all... Yeah. We are ready to work together again from the World Council with Bosco University Medicine Faculty, Dr. Rahma. Thank you for all the attendance and all the speakers. Yes. Uh, maybe uh, uh, Dean of the uh, Medical Faculty, Dr. Marhaen, you want to uh, say something, speech, in the last of the webinar? There is Dr. Marhaen in here. Your voice, Doc. Your voice, Doc. Yes. Yeah. Closing speech, Dr. Marhaen. Mm -hmm. There is no voice. You can hear. Yes, but it's very okay. loud, loud, more loud, uh, Doc. Okay, thank you very much. How about now? No, it's far away. <laughs> far away? Yeah, I'm sorry. Okay, because I think uh, it's be better I talk directly from the... Uh, mic, but you cannot see my my face. Uh, I would like to thanks to our collaborator, Prof. Davy, to support us to uh, make it uh, 
uh, our dream can be true. I think uh, this seminar related to the, our uh, goal, how to uh, take from the outside to our country, to buy our country and to develop uh, the research in our country, like uh, in abroad. And as you know, Dr. Uh, Fernando and also uh, Prof. Renhold is my, my old friend when I study in Japan around 20 years ago. We are grow up together. They are my mentor. He teach me uh, how uh, be a researcher and also how to enjoy the life in Japan as a uh, football player. We have uh, one football international student. Uh, we, me, we call the football club is Okaya, uh, the Dinamo Okayama. And this is a uh, very interesting because during the busy time in the laboratory, uh, Medida, Professor Medida now, <laughs> take me to the, to the football player and playing together with the Brazilian, Argentinian, Paraguay. <laughs> and I'm just an Indonesian player. But uh, the point is, is uh, how to make it uh, together. There is no border in the international student. And I'm so happy because now uh, mm -hmm. uh, Reinhold Medina will be the professor in UK and Fernando go around the South America to teach about the robotic surgery. Okay. This is very uh, good achievement for us. And also when I stay in Malaysia, Dr. Moni Rudin is already my brother. We are come together in Kuala Lumpur. Uh, he's from Hiroshima University and I'm from Okayama University and we are doing a lot of things in Kuala Lumpur. I'm very appreciate now he uh, will be a professor in medicine. I think this is a good achievement for him. And also Prof. Debbie is my friend from my uh, kids area. Yeah? In the garden. <laughs> we are uh, study together in kindergarten. Yes, it's and true. <laughs> and still we uh, maintenance until today, uh, our friendship and brotherhood. Uh, <laughs> and I hope uh, someday Prof. Debi also will join us in uh, Motowa University as a professor, visiting sure. professor in some uh, like this, because uh, the person like uh, Prof. Debi is amazing, beautiful, smart, and rich. <laughs> <It's> very <laughs> amazing. Rich. Thank you so much uh, for support our uh, webinar will be come true. It's just the dream and we connect all the people from the UK, from South America, from uh, Middle East and from uh, Malaysia and Indonesia. It's very difficult during, but the pandemic make me connect with each other. And this is a super smart society in 5.0. I think so. Uh, thank you very much. And all participants, you can uh, uh, sacrifice your time to attend this event until uh, 6 p.m. I hope uh, the seminar will be open your mind to be international uh, community, to be the super smart society in the future. And the last one, I would like to thank to uh, my Secretary University, the representative, our uh, president of university, Prof. Salipalu, uh, to attend in this uh, webinar. And we expect someday uh, she will be uh, more, more uh, get the uh, presentation in the university. I hope so someday she will be a professor like uh, Prof. Davy because he uh, in the same age in high school. I know very much because uh, 
I saw close with her. <laughs> we, uh, we discussed about this webinar a long time ago, and uh, please invite the baby to come to the webinar. Uh, Anti-aging. It's, it's in April. Uh, for me, uh, for baby, she's prime. She, uh, she is uh, prime for baby. But now I know why they so <laughs> force me to get, to get, to to make this uh, happen this seminar. Okay, thank you so much. I think uh, in the future, uh, Bosowa University and then Celtech Stem Cell Center for, will design the MOU and will be cooperate in the uh, many things like a webinar and research and probably to uh, save the, the human life. Thank you so much for attending this seminar. Uh, Ahirul Kalam, Bilai Taufik Wal Hidayah. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you, uh, Dean of Medical Faculty, Dr. Marhaen, Master Biomed, PhD, for the closing speech. And as moderator, thank you all presenter. The topic is very amazing and futuristic. I hope we meet again in another webinar. Uh, before I close this uh, webinar, maybe we take a photo first. Yes, picture. Oh, yeah, picture. Uh, all the participants, maybe you want to you, uh, own the video. Yes. Uh, for admin, please take the picture. Say one, two, three. Gilang, please. Oke, okay. one, two, three. Again, again. Once again, one, two, three. Uh, take the picture of all the uh, participant, Gilang. Already? Uh, yeah, photographer. Eh? <laughs> oh, yes. Uh, okay. Uh, okay. Uh, University, thank you very much. Dr. Marheim, great. And also, yeah. Thank you very much, Prof. Yeah. D. Oh, yeah. thank you, Secretary, my friend. <laughs> <laughs> of international webinar with the title Advanced Medicine <laughs> in Medical Society 5.0. Me, Rahmawati Tamrin, as moderator, would like to thank to, uh, the audience for participation. We also apologize if there is awards or action uh, that are less pleasing. Uh, that's all from us. I hope we will uh, meet another time. Stay safe all. Yeah. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam.